Right, we are recording. It's recording, yeah. Um, I'll say cheers, Rossi. Look, we'll, we'll talk about how you get that to us um, uh, uh, once we've finished. Um, uh, Fee's just gone up so, there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell it's me about four points. That's about four points now. I, I forgot you're, you're an extremely busy man at the moment, so uh, uh, we'll, you know we'll, we'll keep this nice and we'll keep this nice and brief. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, um, we're joined by Tom Howard, uh, Tom Hounsell, uh, and um, due to feedback from the students around um, uh, the topics that they've proposed, and also having a better looking sort of panel, um, we've uh, we've invited Andy uh, Ross. Uh, from Chelsea Football Club Academy, who's their under 16s coach, uh, joint coach, and actually that might be quite an interesting area to explore, and, uh, Andy, in a minute. Um, and Andy's not only set this up, but he's recording it for us. So, uh, yeah, yeah, his fee has indeed doubled. Um, Andy, welcome. Um, could you just sort of introduce yourself and give us an idea of maybe what a day to day, a week, typical week looks like outside of the current period of time? Yeah, okay, yeah. So as Michael, we'll call you Michael, as he mentioned, I'm the joint on the 16 coach at Chelsea, uh, Andy Ross. And um, sorry, you want me to what we're currently is going on, or you mean what would normally be going on? Yeah, no, no, what would you normally do? Yeah, what's it? Because, yeah. you know, under 16 is a really unique role, I think, uh, within, a, within a football club. It's a pivotal age group, as I think Tom Howard will probably dis discuss. Uh, in his, with his experiences uh, in a minute, but yeah, what would what would a you kind of a normal routine be? And and I'm, it'd be really interesting, I think, for our students to understand your sort of joint role that you have with with Jack. Yeah. Well, normally we'd be um, we have uh, seven full time lads, and then we have another six day release lads. So the normally during the week, uh, what day are we on today? Losing track. It's a Thursday. Would be a, a day where um, you'd have a, a double session. Actually, you'd have a technical in the morning, and then you'd have a group training session in the uh, in the, the early evening with the the full time lads and also the day release lads. So your normal week is you know it's pretty full on really with with five or six sessions a week. Um, but all I will say, what's unique to the 16s is we have come away we've come off them a lot at the moment because they would have their GCSEs normally. So the priority goes to the school. So if the teachers want them for extra lessons, we have been told, you know, look, we have to make school the priority. So that's definitely something that's that's changed in the last, you know, since Christmas really. Up till Christmas, it was a case of the lads were were fighting for contracts, and football was was the most important while still keeping their schoolwork up. But now that's completely changed. They've all got their contracts in the bag, or they've. You know, we, we, we let a few players go who are looking for new clubs and the uh, the education is the, the priority. So, you know, you, you're still maintaining fitness, you're getting them ready for youth team football. But yeah, you, you're stressing to them how important school work is. And, and obviously that's completely changed with everything that's going on. But um, that, that's your typical week. That must be it. a couple of things there, Andy. Sorry, and I lost connection there. So I'm surprised you were talking for that long. I lost you for about 30 seconds. So. Well done, Andy, for carrying on there. Um, I, I, the education bit is a really interesting one, isn't it? Particularly at that age group where where the value of education, I guess, can wane ever so slightly, can can begin to diminish. Um, how do you, as a coach, sort of really enforce that? Well, the main thing we've been doing, because it's so important for the lads to, to get it done. Look, firstly, if they don't get the maths or English grades required, they have to do them when they become apprentices. So right. that's your, your ultimate, really, because you just say, to, look, lads, get it out of the way, <laughs> it, with all respect, because then when you are full time, when you are next year on your scholarship, uh, on your apprenticeship, sorry, then you, you don't have to go back and do that. So that's that's more for the lads that struggle with a bit of motivation and obviously don't really want to do the schoolwork. Um, yeah. Now, you still get lads that, that won't do it and they'll need extra nudges. And what we've an agreement we came to with the teachers was that, look, they, they miss training sessions. You know, the worst case scenario, they'd miss a game. Uh, luckily, we haven't had to go that far, but we, you know, a session here or there has been missed so that the lads understand, well, look, we take your football away from you because that's how important the school work is now. Yeah, just, yeah. just to get that complete. And, you know, they've all, in fairness to them, been, been brilliant. You know, they, they might have missed one or two here, but they're certainly not missed a lot. You know, they've realised, well, I don't want to be missing out on training. 
Yeah, um, and uh, sort of, an, uh, I open this up to to Tom Hounsell as well. But I think that in in my experiences, the value of education has uh, has changed, even probably in the last two or three years, where I think the players are now valuing it. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily as, as equally as their football, but there's definitely a greater um, importance placed on it, and I think they recognise the importance of that as well. Yeah. yeah. Go on, Tom. Sorry, Tom. Go on. I just think um, I think you've probably seen like a, particularly with like at first team level, probably just an influx of maybe some of the, particularly the European lads, first team players who still carry on their studies um, or are invested in like different businesses. I think they, the amount of stuff that they do outside of like just their day to day training regimes probably like trickles down a little bit. Um, we certainly see like a lot of scholars now invested in like further study, whether that's taking on additional A levels um, or not. But I think it, I think it's probably just a little bit of a cultural cultural shift. Um, but I was just, I was just interested, Rossi, if, if you've got boys who potentially have been offered like you know pros on top of their scholars, you know the motivation must be really like a real challenge for those individuals to you know invest in their education because. They've probably got a lucrative deal lined up. Uh, what's your experiences of that? Yeah, you're, you're spot on. Yeah, most of the lads do get offered a, a pro on top of their their um, apprenticeship. So you, you are dealing with lads that are going to be earning decent money really early on. You know, some of them as soon as September of, of this year will straight away be going on a pro contract. So you're trying to motivate them to to learn, lads. You still need to get your your English qualification, your maths qualification, but but as I said before, probably the biggest one is, look, if you don't do it, it's compulsory that you have to then redo it next year. A similar qualification when, when you're a first year, regardless of if you're a pro or not. So that's definitely the, the best one to say, because let, let's be honest, some lads, you know, they don't want to be doing schoolwork. Simple as that. They don't, you know, they, whether they already see themselves as, you know, going to be millionaire footballers, this, that, we, we have to do our best to say, look, lads, keep your feet in the ground and, and then uh, get the hard work done now, and, and then you know, look, it's up to you after that. Really, you can you can do what you want. We'll guide you as best we can. But I, I think I think really interesting. I don't know if you saw uh, the interview with Tamori uh, Rossi, Tom and Tom, where he spoke at a press conference. I think it was for one of the BBC Radio Five Live uh, sports commentators, and he, he spoke really not only really well, but he spoke about his studies um, and a real sort of perspective on the fact that you know this is only this isn't going to last beyond you know all of my life I need to be prepared for something else so I also wonder whether whether the education that that uh, academy football players are receiving now about what to do post football um, is, is also getting better as well yeah well for Cal, I think like Tom said before the the influence of others I think for is a brilliant one because he's still studying and he's playing Premier League international football and the yeah. lads look up to him they do you know they see that and he's a he's a great one to use because you you know it's not I don't know if certain people look at it and go oh, I'm not going to study this and that but then you see a Fakal Tamori doing it and you're going well what why can't why can't you do that you know he's, yeah. he's an international yeah. footballer so yeah. People like that, are, you know, as Tom said, great influences um, on it. And, and I do think as well, the sort of flexibility now with further studies, like we've got lads that are going to do barber courses um, and things like that, you know, they're, they're looking down different paths. It doesn't have to be academic necessarily, but, you know, they are looking for other like business ventures they can do and, and you know, and, and invest their money when they, when they do get that, you know, when they do come across money. Rossi, let's hope they, that some of them go into beard trimming uh, yeah. organisations as well. Yeah? Oh, COVID. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Apologies. So just, you just um, and again, I don't want to. I don't want to embarrass you, Rossi and, and Tom. It'd be really interesting if we sort of retrospectively look back, but uh, just on the, I guess, the final bit on on education uh, with regards to football players. Tom, obviously, you you got to a certain age and released, and Rossi, you were a. Did you were you a whitey at, at Chelsea before you went off to become a professional elsewhere? Uh, I was well, without looking like a, an idiot and being myself. I, I was twenty. I was twenty when I left, so I was. I got oh, a two okay. as well, so I was. Okay. I just 
putting out there, Ezzy, in case you bury me. Sorry, no, no, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't realise you got to that level. So I, I, I feel even more honoured now to have uh, experienced your uh, coaching and playing ability. Um, so you, you kind of went off to up to Scotland, is that right, to play? Yeah. Professionally? Yeah. Uh, did you? I mean, how, when you were a player coming through, what was the, the um, you know, how much emphasis did you place on education? Then, do you think? Yeah, I, t- I didn't mind school. I'm not just saying that. I didn't mind it, but I, I was also when I got to 16 and I was, you know, starting my apprenticeship. I, I wasn't planning on doing any further studies at the time, which stupid when I look back now. I wish I just put a bit of time in, but um, and it, it wasn't compulsory at the time when I was at a club to do it either. Uh, and there wasn't as many options. So a million different reasons. I, I wish I had done it, but I, I did, you know, okay at school. So I wasn't, I didn't ever think, you know, I don't need to do this. I still made a big effort at school. But yeah, I, you know, being honest, as soon as I got my apprenticeship, I was uh, I was ready to not, you know, stop further studies. But, you know, regret that now. What, but there you go. what would a, what would a uh, 30-year-old, Rossi say to a, to his 16 year old now in terms of education do you think yeah I would have said to eat you know language you do a language do business studies do something you know didn't have to be specific but do something that's, that's going to help you in future life that you know you can apply because let's be honest you just mm. don't know how your careers are going to go you don't know how long you're going to last what's going to happen injury you, you, you've got to prepare yourself you know as best yeah. you can yeah. And, and fast forward a few years, and only a few years, uh, to Tom Howard. Tom, you, um, you've obviously taken a quite a unique route. What would, I mean, was it something that you valued, do you think, when you were a 16-year-old getting your, or, or working towards your uh, apprenticeship? I you were so funny about that part, but um, oh, no, sorry, no, no, sorry. I think um, education, um, when was this when I started in 2011? Um, I started as a as a scholar. Um, the education program that we had was fairly limited. Like all boys were expected to complete a, a BTEC in sport um, when we were full time. Um, but I was the only out of I think it was 13 of us to um, complete uh, like extra and additional A levels. Um, Probably born a little bit from the fact, similar to Rossi, that I, I like school, I enjoyed school and um, wanted to try and make sure that I had other options if if things didn't work out. Um, obviously, I had the benefit of, of my mum and dad being not pushy, but certainly encouraging the fact that it would enable me to have a broader career options moving forward. Um, and then I suppose ultimately when after the two years as a scholar, my contract wasn't renewed, that the fact that I did um, complete these extra qualifications was probably um, a massive, massive part of me being able to forge what's hopefully going to be a successful career in a completely different domain. Um, and it certainly enabled me to have a smoother transition into further study at, at university, which maybe some of my peers at the time that had um, similar situations out of contract maybe went searching for other football clubs and maybe now playing it in non-league and and some of them even not playing, they probably found it a bit tougher to adapt to the world outside of football. Um, so I think that the benefit of people like Fakayo on the complete opposite end of the scale to me, for example, where he's like, his football career has flourished and is it, as Rossi said, he's a elite player playing for Chelsea's first team and is an international footballer. Um, but I think it's also important for some boys to see that if it doesn't work out um, a little bit sooner than that, that if you get your head down and, and focus on the other stuff as well, um, that you, you can have a career in something else if you put your mind to it. And I, I think one big piece of advice I'd, I'd give would be that it doesn't have to detract from your football whatsoever, albeit I, I didn't get offered a professional contract at 18. I don't think, or well, I know that the fact that I completed further studies had no bearing on that whatsoever. Um, so I think that's important. Yeah, it, it just struck me, and, and please take this the right way, guys. I'm just looking at my screen. I've got, you know, three, in inverted commas, failed football players who've been released and have made a success out of their 
uh, out of their failure. So um, it's a you know congratulations to to you know all, all three of you for for making the most of it. Sorry, Thanks. sorry, Thanks. Luke, I'm sorry. That was a real highlight. Thank you. That's right. Sorry. Yeah. Um, we kind of education wasn't necessarily on the list, but we kind of went off 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 piece a little bit then. Um, Rossi, just coming back to to your explanation of a week, what 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 do you think at the moment? The if you think about our, our 16s going to youth team uh, to, into the professional development phase, and I guess the same thing to you, Tom, as well. What do you think they're ready for, and what do you think they still need more of? Can I go, Tom. Uh, you, you can feel free to go first, mate. <laughs> what do I think they need? Well, it's difficult because of the situation. We're, we're just trying to firstly make sure they're all right because we've got lads from all different backgrounds. So yeah. that, that is the most important thing. The, obviously, the welfare of themselves and their families. Um, but fitness is is crucial in the respect that they don't we don't want them sitting around playing the computer all day. But you also, with the longer this goes on, you don't want them peaking 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 and then suddenly you know it keeps going it keeps going we've got to find a, a balance of saying look lads you, you you need to keep your fitness ticking over but don't kill yourselves at the moment because we haven't got an end date so the, the, the fitness requirements ticking over but then obviously you just want them to keep their touch in so we're sitting at the moment we've got our, on the whatsapp group we've got this um, these technical challenges that the lads get drawn out of hat every night and um, they have to set a challenge by 12 o'clock the next day. That's been brilliant. It's been, you know, some really hard ones on there. I've been joining in. I've been like feeling about 90 years old trying to join in with some of them. But, you know, they're, they're brilliant. And it really makes you think because they're not straightforward. So hopefully the lads are sort of they're taking, you know, 45 an hour out of their day to go right. Yeah. There are the challenges they can do indoors with tennis balls and all that, but they're having to think. Right, okay, I need to do this to get that right, and etc. So we're, you know, just just keeping them tuned in, motivated, keeping the fitness levels to a certain, you know, certain point as well at the moment. Yeah. That's the key things. Yeah, yeah, and and outside of this week, if we strip away, if this was a normal season now, what would you think your our, our under 16s would have to go? Yeah, I'm really confident that they've got these elements to go and play for the youth team. Mm -hmm. Some of them would have done so already, I guess. Um, and actually, you know what? They still need to do this, this, and this. Bearing in mind, it would obviously be uh, different for each individual player. But what, 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 what do you think of the? You know, yeah, most of them have got this, but still probably need to work on this, this, and this. So yeah, exactly. yeah, Rossi, yeah, 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 Rossi, yeah. Yeah, well, we're lucky that the full-time lads get to train with the youth team a lot, so right. they they know firsthand what's required of okay. being a youth team player. They. Um, know the coaches they get what their ideas are and how to work with them so that's mm. that's great I, you know that's as good as you, you can get it's the day release lads that now they they don't actually do so sorry just to explain day release quickly as they get a day off school to come in and spend with us but mm. that's that was stopped anyway because of their gcses right. so they we were getting really limited contact now with the day release players we're getting you know mm. two sessions a week some lads were turning up once a week and playing a game so you then right. You are then looking exactly what you said. Are they prepared for youth team football? Are mm. they going to take longer to adapt? But, um, you know, as, as you all know, sometimes players can surprise you. You know, what they're doing away, even though it's a reduced programme, you know, suddenly they, they come into that full time programme and they just flourish. You know, they just, uh, yeah. it's what you're waiting for. And, and, and it kind of goes against everything you, you think that you have to do, you know, X amount of hours a week and all that. Some lads will just come in and fly next year, but not always the case. It depends how they adapt. It's it's funny, and but before Tom, I get you to answer this, and, and Tom Howard as well, and your experiences. It's funny with some of the stuff that we're seeing on on feedback from uh, on on WhatsApp through through different groups. I posed the question on one age group. I won't say it, but actually, are they doing better because they're not being coached? Um, and I won't tell you what what reply I got to that, but. Um, but for me, it's really fascinating, and just to see, you know, how those boys have actually technically have, have, have got better in a, in a relatively short space of time. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if anyone wants to to answer that before I come back to you, Tom, about your experiences with Fulham. You, you want me to answer the, what, what question about players getting about 
better without that, being touched. Yeah, yeah. What was it, the under nines? <laughs> <laughs> I won't really know. It was an older age group. It was an older age group. It was the under 16s. No. <laughs> <laughs> Probably was. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, I just, I just, for me, it's fascinating seeing these boys technically. It may be, it, it's obviously not as simple as that, but I think it's definitely worth a question around around you know what what do we actually do if we have we kept a lid on some of them have, have they are they now released to kind of go and do do their own stuff and, and work in at their own speed and and ability to learn yeah i think the interesting thing that i found is just around um when we well like, we haven't necessarily been that prescriptive on practice um we've just tried to inspire boys to, to continue to be active and to uh, still have like a, a technical program, but obviously recognising that each individual player has got different circumstances, so don't want to be too prescriptive during this period. Um, but it's just interesting to know what boys practice, and do they practice the things that they're already they already are like accomplished at, or actually do they go and like practice the things that they're not so accomplished at, or things that you just wouldn't think that they would invest time in practicing at all. Um, just give probably just gives you a window into a like boys like habits in relation to what they do outside of the program but then also maybe the things that they themselves or the stakeholders in their lives parents think are important for those players um it's probably been informative from that perspective i think yeah no thank you thanks for that, tom i'm um, sorry we, we, it's been a bit of a uh a sort of a random uh, ski slalom sort of conversation at the moment. Just coming back to that question then about, from a Fulham perspective, Tom, is there much integration from a 15, 16s youth team perspective? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, like quite a lot. I think um, similarly, like there's joint training sessions, which I think are really useful. And um, also just like uh, some like where the boys work on their individual targets, they're also like coupled together. Um, I think that transition is good. Um, and then I also think just the nature of like us like presenting back our season plans to each other to make sure that actually we don't have just have season plans for these players in relation to the team, but then the individuals, but they're actually 18 months, <clears throat> 24 month plans where, you know, particularly 15s, we, we have a direct idea around how we think we're going to need to support them to get a scholarship at our club and then who basically is responsible for doing that. And I think it just holds everyone to account a little bit. Um, and the reviews of those plans are, are pretty important. Um, I think the interesting thing, like probably from like both at this current moment in time with circumstances we face, but then just generally, it's just, I suppose it's the part which we probably don't hold enough value in, is just how do we support the boys in, in relation to transition to scholar around off pitch stuff um you know potentially moving to digs away from families independence ability to cook meals like sleep properly all of those sort of professional habits i suppose they're the things that uh, and particularly now I, i'm i'm we're probably starting to try to consider how we actually um facilitate those things i saw um I think it was a tweet the other day from I think it was Oxford United, but they basically had like a menu of um, of skills that they wanted the players to to work on. It wasn't anything to do with football, so it was like um, day one you're going to learn how to scramble an egg. Day two, like learn how to clean the bathroom. Day three, you're going to do I don't know, do the dishes, whatever it might be. Um, but I just thought it was quite a unique perspective in a way to look at things. Um, probably maybe like an <laughs> from my own perspective probably a bit of an oversight really um and then that was probably emphasized mm -hmm. by a lad like sent in his technical program and then he was also sent in like a, a banana bread that he made and i was like one i would never have put him down for baking um but it was just like a like a real insight to go actually these boys are probably investing in loads of different skills that probably haven't given like appreciation to them. I th yeah, and I, I, th I think this, this again, I think uh, coming back when, when we come out of this, it'll be really interesting to know how much do we continue doing that and give the, the boys time to do those examples, Tom, or, or do we go straight back into, you know, technical, tactical, getting bigger and stronger and faster. So it will be really interesting. Tom Howard, just in, in terms of what you've heard for the last sort of 10 minutes, how, how did that fit with your sort of experiences 
one about playing up when you were younger, so 16s to youth team, and then obviously you were in digs for uh, a year. So uh, can you talk to us about what, what that was like? Um, in terms of training up with the youth team, probably only train with them maybe for part of time as a 16. Um, and that would have come right at the end of the season when the youth team um, were short on players and were in youth cup runs. So they needed players to, to fill the league squad. And I suppose a combination of that season, I didn't play loads of football, but I don't think it happened as regularly and a little bit like what Rossi's alluded to um, earlier about there being a bit of a split between like the boys' programme. Um, we probably had less boys that were, there was no one that was full-time, but we certainly had boys that were in maybe more regularly than than others. Um, so I think that has a an impact when, when you do start the, the following year in terms of um, what you're exposed to physically is a is a big change but I think um, looking back on it for me despite not playing loads of football as a under 15 or 16 really um, I was able to have a, a fairly positive start to, to my first year as a scholar and in fact the whole season was it was a positive one for me but I think a big part of that was the transition I had to, to moving out into into digs for two years as a scholar was um really smooth i moved in with house parents and a family that i'd probably still meet four or five times a year um so i think those the environment that you're in at the time can have a, a major part on on the mindset you have and i was returning home from training every afternoon or evening and and knowing that i was in a in a place where i could have conversations with people and and maybe get away from the game a little bit but it, it really suited me so I don't think as you say it should be underestimated what the your home life and that might be at digs when you're a scholar is like um so I th certainly think it enabled me to despite not playing loads of football as a 15 and 16 year old um have a a first year that was full of loads of game time and some real positive experiences um so yeah I, I certainly think that ensuring that we, we take that into consideration is is a is a really big part of things thanks for that tom just looking at it from a coaching perspective obviously your typical week outside of this the current circumstances what i mean how many hours would you spend on the pitch and how many hours would you spend i guess doing coaching in its broader sense like working you know supporting the players through uh, case study reviews or or you know dropping in on classroom sessions or physical sessions or you know other sort of more, the more holistic uh, support that we provide tip well, again two different um, parts to it because the full-time lads I mean you're doing up to 10 hours of coaching mm. uh, doubles on a, a Wednesday and a Thursday Tuesday mornings, Friday mornings, and then your game on a Saturday. But uh, the day release lads, you, you're getting a Tuesday night and a Thursday night. So a big difference in, in training time. But if you're just talking about <clears> full time lads, you know, the support they're getting uh, throughout the week, they're getting a um, football education lesson every Wednesday, which is either led by the coaching staff or the analyst, or we have somebody from, from outside come in. You know, that might be um, something like a sporting chance or um, kick it out so it'll be you know that sort of education for them in lessons we're trying to support them as well we go and show show our faces and, and encourage them you know look what you're doing at the moment show an interest in, in the work they're doing so I'll, I'll be honest the full-time lads get a lot of get a lot of support they really do which yeah. you know, what you were saying earlier Rezi, you know, we sometimes have to be careful that we're not doing everything for them in a lot of ways you know it's like yeah. I'm a big fan of, look lads, this is your time now, you know, you, you've got to come up with your own, you know, be responsible, What? be creative, you're right, your individual um, lesson here, technical session, you're going to lead on it for 45 minutes, what, what are you going to come up with? We'll support you, but, you know, because otherwise I just feel that we just, it can get a bit robotic and it can get a bit, um, you know, like, oh, what, what, what do you want us to do, you know, rather than coming up with their own ideas? I don't know if yeah, yeah. you know, that, but. I'm 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 really interested in what you said, Rossi, and I, I I I've probably been meaning to ask this for a long time. And again, Tom and Tom, please jump in with any questions on this. How do you manage the, I guess, the more of the psychological and the social 
element between the boys who are on part time and the, and the boys that are on full time because you know n- n- without being uh well b- being really crude about it basically we're saying full timers you've got a really good chance and part timers we're still not sure so we'll, we'll give we'll give you an opportunity um so how how have you managed that sort of the the to, to motivate and to psychologically and socially support those part time boys Chuck, yeah, Chuck. Russell, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Um, well, look, little things, you, you definitely have to be aware of it. So there's, there's little things we've done, whereas we've created a full-time WhatsApp group, which may sound stupid, but things that are happening with the full-time lads, you don't want to be going, oh, look, lads, let's, we're, we're going on a, we're going to go and go bowling today to break it up. And then you put that on the WhatsApp group with every <laughs> single player. Yeah, you know? that's like rubbing it in their faces. Yeah, so yeah. Little things like creating a separate group so that the... The lads, I'm sure they'll find that anyway, the day release lads, but, you you know, you're being sensitive. Um, okay. But when it comes to those, we, we always use examples. I mean, Tariq Lamptey is the latest one, and I'm sure Tom mm-hmm. will have loads. You know, lads that were on uh, day release programmes as opposed to full-time programmes, and they've gone on and been professionals. I think Fakal was... Yeah, yeah, Fakal was a part-time. He wasn't full-time, was he? Yeah. So we're always using those examples with the lads to say, look, it's it's not... It doesn't you're not going to be a footballer and and who knows what the right way is and what the wrong way is um sorry blab on it i'm going on here but another mm-hmm. thing the full-time lads is that they're basically at cobham 24 7 where the training grounds you know their digs are in cobham that their lives are like just cobham so they, they're not getting anything else apart from that whereas the day release lads are getting themselves in on the train they're, they're getting other skills that are like look you know look, you need to uh, be at a training ground saturday morning half seven how are you going to get there you know and, and they have to find a way to get there stupid, stupid little things like that i think are adding to their character that, that i know helped me when i was coming through because i i had to find a way to right, jump on the train get myself to the train and i didn't have people running me about this you know everywhere but um and then sorry the last thing on that is just on the football side of it actual like you know technical there's lads that aren't in the full-time program they're still playing for their school and little mm-hmm. like this, you know, even in their break time, they're getting a kick a ball around with their mates. Yeah. Our lads, the full time lads aren't getting as much freedom, I don't think, as that. No. So, you know, things that you would do with your mates, flicking balls over people's heads or in a school game, you're not going to do that for your, your club, your Fulham's, your Chelsea's on a Sunday because you wouldn't mm-hmm. get away with it. But you, yeah. so you're not getting a chance to free up and practice those skills. I, you know, again, it's a personal point of view, but I, I can only relate to what I did, you know, when I was growing up. And I loved playing for my school and my county yeah. and all that because I, I, it was a different sort of release, really, to, to be a different player. You are going to be yeah. a, a club. Sorry, I've gone on there. No, 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 no. no. It's, it, and, Ross, it's, 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 it's fascinating. It's a great insight you're, you're giving. And, I, I, you know, again, I think we take for granted, one, Cobham, but two, particularly for those full-time boys who may have grown up in inner London, suddenly they're, they're put in, you know, leafy and wealthy Surrey and it, it must be a significant culture shock for them and you know there's this bubble that's that's surrounded uh you know yes the training ground but even Cobham itself is is a fairly sort of affluent area and, and I think you're right what what life skills are they missing out on um for, uh, Tom from a Fulham perspective you yours go full-time at 16 is that right yeah well they uh we basically have like the day release program. So those boys are in essence, like full time. So they'll come in every day. So the boys who are actually like partnered with, with Coombe will be full time. Um, mm-hmm. You'll have the part time boys who will just come in similar, just for like another, another one afternoon, depending on some individuals, it might be two. Um, but just, it's, it's more determined by like the individual players, where they live, how they're getting on at school. Cause a lot of the time there's like talk that, so not all our best players will be on the full-time programme just because actually they might be doing really well in their current school and there's not really a need to switch schools and have that disruption really. So mm. it's probably not as split as like evenly as it sounds that, that Chelsea's is. But I think it also, for the, the part-time lads, it probably goes, um, it probably helps them in scholarship decisions, I think, just because I think people will go, well, imagine what he'd be like training every day um and it almost no one actually knows that the answer to that question is a bit surface level because it's just a bit of an assumption but people go kai you'd be brilliant if you trained every day 
um, and it probably goes, it probably helps them. Whereas the full time, I think the full time lads can, uh, it's, like, it's, it's odd, but I think it can, I think the environment can really like stagnate a little bit. It can be like sterilised. It's like the same thing all the time. Mm. They're probably the boys, I think, at the moment who are really struggling um, because it's like it's ripped their routine out completely. And they, the reality for them is that they spend pretty much all day every day at the club and now that's been removed um, yeah. so I think they're the individuals that are really struggling so I think Rossi makes a great point where it's like actually the part-time boys have such a diverse um, experience in in like in relation to what they're actually get like exposed to I think it does mm. help over time yeah I think it's a really good point and just to pick up on something you, you mentioned there Tom and, and we asked Tom Howard and, and, and Rossi this question any any players spring to mind that have come through that have gone you, you know at 15 16 where you've gone not not too sure and he's gone onto a part-time route and then then has obviously now gone on to to bigger and better things maybe it's taken slightly longer to uh, to develop into a potential first team international player um, Tom. Uh, yeah give me time to think one thing I add to that, I think it's important that the boys at the moment have, a, have an understanding that whichever situation they find themselves in at the moment, whether that's a full-time programme or a part-time programme, that success in terms of football success can be achieved through both. And I think that's, as Rossi said, a, a message that they try and convey with examples, um, which is really important. Um, I think I certainly agree with what both Tom and Rossi have said in terms of my own experiences. I think I've benefited massively from still going to school three times a week in year 10 and 11 um, and having loads of different social experiences. And I think I think clubs are getting so much better now at trying to manufacture them in full time programmes because we're beginning to understand the importance of them for, for even full time players and, and professional players to experience them because um, we, we all know it can be a, a game that can be taken away from you uh, at any moment. So I think I think that's really really important to to say that. And I'm unbelievably grateful that I was able to carry on at 15, 16 in an environment where, as you said, I was learning different skills that hopefully stand me in good stead now. Um, so I think moving forward, we, we just as a football as, as a whole needs to get. Um, even more effective at, at trying to ensure that players that are in full-time programs still get a, an ample amount of that. Um, in terms of players that I, I know definitely and I've had conversations in the past about players that have done that, but yeah, I suppose Fakayo is a great example at the moment. Um, that there's, I'm just trying to think of other, other examples I might pass over to these two I would think about different people that I've I've played with, but um, yeah, Rossi, Rossi, whilst Tom Howard is, is is having to think, any you've obviously how many you were under 14s and 15s and then 16s coach, so you, I guess you followed some of those players through. But any ones that you coached at a younger age group that are now gone on to flourish, you would have gone mm, don't quite see it, but have, but have surprised you. Well, I don't really want to name names there, is he? Put me uh, stitching me up there. <laughs> uh, there's, there's definitely a couple of lads who you would you would have gone. Not sure how they're going to do. Uh, you know, we all know that it's there's no crystal balls. You just do not know yeah. how they're going to react. But they've they've gone into a full time program and they've they have they've, they've flourished. They've found their maybe living away from home suits them better and and being with the lads and they've really enjoyed it. So, but you know that that was at the right time. There was sixteen. They've gone into who knows if they've gone at 14. Like Tom said, they might have become a bit, you know, a bit stale and you know with the environment. So for them, it was it was the right thing. But there's a couple at the moment. Look, a lad, Henry Lawrence, who's who yeah. was, um, you know, he's he's flying at the moment. He's been up with the 23s. He's only a second year. <clears throat> played, you know, he sort of he was vital in the FA Youth Cup run this mm -hmm. season. So he's he's one that for me, you know, what am I saying? He was a good player, really good, solid, dependable, but was not one that you'd think would rip up trees in his second year. That, that's uh, being honest. I Henry yeah. really find offence with that, but that's credit to him. He's just, yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot of it is his, his attitude. Actually, more than anything, he has just gone. I'm going to give it my best shot, and, and yeah. that's why he's in the position he's in. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, I think Emery's a, a, a really good shout of that. And considering the, you know, the conversations that were being had around him when he was younger around, you know, uh, it's a credit to himself, the, the position he's put himself in. Yeah. And obviously the co- uh, the coaching that he was exposed to, Rossi, as well. Very true, yeah. <laughs> yeah, his, his best attributes are his attitude and his mentality. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm conscious we've been talking now for 45 minutes and uh, Rossi, just coming back to to your sort of coaching here, is there any, uh, what, what would you say that uh, is, is what do you enjoy doing most about being on the pitch? What, what is it that you kind of go, yeah, this is the reason why I do do this, this job? But my, my, the best thing for me is game day. Without a shadow of a doubt, I live for game day. That's just always yeah. been who I am. But in terms of your, your day-to-day training, it's um, but that's sounding too too cheesy. It's it is it's seeing the lads evolve and take things on board and add it to their game and and enjoy it. So it's you know it's easy to say, oh, it's a certain part of this, that, or anything. But the real the real best thing is when you do actually see a lad who's working hard during the week and then he'll go out of the weekend and he'll put it into practice and you're going, brilliant, you know, like he's he's really yeah. taken that on board, like credit to him. So, you know, that's, you know, ma- match day is by far and away my my favourite day, but... Can I ask a question on that, Rossi? Sorry. Yeah, of course, yeah. Probably just because uh, we, we, we come up against you a lot and uh, just in like competitions and in uh, just generally really like, you must like uh, you. You obviously win a lot of games, um, and natu- and competitions as a consequence. So just, I'm just interested in how you like continue to like challenge the players and also like yourself really in relation to like pushing pushing players. Like I know, you know, our games program is really varied, so our position will vary as well. But yeah. it's really interested in like how you continue to like motivate yourself and players probably more so around like continuing to have high standards in, in fixtures. Yeah, something we talk about a lot because it, it isn't, yeah, you're right, it's not just the players, it's also the coaching staff yeah. because you, you can find and it, you'll be the same, there'll be certain games that you just know are going to be a bit, of a, a bit of a walkover and the lads know it as well because you play teams home and away and if you've already beaten them seven nil in the first fixture away and then they're coming at home you, you've got to find different motivation levels so like as coaching staff we're just always trying to make sure that we're we're saying look lads you you have you can't have an off day this is part of being a footballer you know you just you don't every, every other team we play it's their cup final so regardless of the the result before or what you think the result was going to be there's, there's going to be there's going to be a um you know, this team wants to take a scalp. They want to come to Chelsea and be, so they want to go to a Fulham and win. Simple as that. So you have to be prepared for that. So look, you're preparing them mentally to be ready for that. That They're always going to face that throughout their careers if they remain at a top club, that they're always going to have to face teams that will sit in or come and try and outwork them and, and kick them. So that side of it. And I think by doing that, by preparing the players, then we have to, you know, walk the walk, talk the talk, we have to then make sure, well, look, we can expect the players to do this, do that and act, you know, like make sure their standards, are, even though we know we could go out there and win the game 6 or it won't be an issue. The, the result wouldn't be the issue. It's the performance and everything else. We have to make sure, well, look, we, we still have to do every bit of detail in the, the pre-match presentation, uh, the preparation, the times, making sure that during the week we're doing the right prep and not just treating it as, ah, oh, well, look, lads, doesn't matter. It's just another game. So I think just just by that, making sure that the players understand how important it is for their careers, it, it may, means that we have to look, we have to be a part of that as well. And we have to make sure that we are doing to the best of our capabilities as well. Hopefully that's quite answer. That's brilliant. Song. Yeah, I, I, yeah it's insightful, yeah. And uh, I, this is me being serious for, for once. It's... it's um. Uh, it's uh, a, not. I was going to say a pleasure. It's not a pleasure, but you can learn a lot. I'm sometimes on the pitch in the evening next to to Rossi and Jack, and the 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 um, level of detail that is that goes into to your planning, Rossi, with Jack is a is a testament to uh, uh, I think what you're saying as well. So um, um, 
yeah it's it, I, I was going to say it's an honor to be on the same pitch with you but um uh, i'm obviously not on the same pitch but it's obviously a, a, an honor to to watch you from a distance um just in some of the points that points that you you've raised and i know we've just been had a pdp document sent round. what what's what what are some of the things that you're going to commit to over the next year to get better at and to to learn to uh, and, and to develop yourself well definitely on the top of my list at the moment is try to um get out the the bubble a bit more um whilst not you know what we've got at cobham is amazing you know it, it is amazing and you don't ever want to get away from learning off the other people there now and i think that's the most important thing it'll be the same at every club some of the experience you got there but it's also i do think it is important to get out there and see other things that are going on and i probably haven't done that enough as much as i'd like to so you know definitely that's at the, at the top of my list to go out there and, and get other experiences even other sports just you know pick up new ideas fresh ideas for the for the lads and for my own own development that's, that would be the the top one, so maybe a little trip to Fulham, Tom, might be on the cards. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sneak you in, mate, no worries. Yeah. Is that is that to, to view a different sport then, yeah? <laughs> yeah. No, probably just a uh, play, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so are you are you opening yourself up to come and do a visiting lecture, Rossi, at St Mary's? Well, you can you can claim travel. Claim travel, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I do live in Twickenham. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah. I'll probably joke there, but that's good because yeah, that's about the only mileage we can afford. Just, just one final question before, and as I say, look, we're really grateful of your time. It's, it's brilliant to, for you to have given up your time. I know you've got, you, you have got. No, I know I, I joke, but there are things to do, and people get uh, asked to do things, particularly this time of day and before Easter. Um, what? You obviously have a quite a unique role with Jack, so I'd be really interested to see how you how you split and manage that that sort of joint coaching role. Uh, for those of us of a certain age, uh, Steve Grit uh, and then Alan Kerbishley spring to mind. Um, but but what's your relationship like there? And then how do you interact with like your your analysts, your physios, sports science staff, the staff above you in terms of who plays up and so on? What what's that like? What does that look like day to day? How does that manifest itself over the week? Sorry, me and Jack working together as joint coaches. So that's one, yeah, one. But yeah. also then you you two have to then interact with with yeah. other support staff within your age groups, but also above as well and below. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is unique. I've never had to do it before where you've, you've been joint coaches. So it is, it's a tough one. I, I found it difficult because, you know, I, I'm, Joy leading, but that's not an um, egotistical thing. I think if I know I'm the assistant, then I'm look. That's that's my job, and I've got to do that to the best of ability and support the lead. But then when you when you've got two leads, it, it, I think at times it can get a bit awkward because I think you both want to further your careers, and you both want to you know it might be a big game. Oh, we got we got to the Premier League final, luckily the international um, competition, and it it was one of those. Well, look, what do we do here? How do we go about this? You know, who's going to lead on? etc so you do have difficult moments but i think you you have to be professional and and you have to make sure that you're not stepping on each other's toes one way we found is look you know jack would lead on certain aspects like for example like lead and um, liaison with the education department and then i don't have to then i'm not going to step on his toes i'll let him do that then i would maybe you know i'd be leading on the pitch for a couple of weeks and so yeah. I know, oh, look, well, this is this is my ideas, these are the games, this is the plan. And then it's, we, we'll always, you know, ideas off each other, but it won't be that, you know, look, oh, well, let's do this today. You know, it's like, yeah, we can actually try and be a bit like, democratic and go, look, look, ultimately I'd make the decision over these two weeks in football, then the next two weeks might be Jack's or, or however it's going to work. But yeah, it's, it isn't straightforward all the time, I don't find. No, and then and then how do you play that out in terms of obviously what players are going to play up, and what players are going to, sorry, how do you then interact with under 18s and then obviously the under 15s in terms of players playing up from your team and then obviously from the 15s. So how do you take how do those roles and responsibilities play out? Well, I mean the youth team will dictate who they want, 
Yeah. So they, um, I suppose that's coming back to an earlier question, that the, the full-time players tend to get favoured on that, rightly or mm. wrong, but it's just because they tie in with that programme. But they'll mm. dictate, so Ed Brown, James Simmons, they'll dictate who's going to come up. They will ask our opinion who's doing well. But, mm. um, and then obviously we'll, we'll take from the 15s. But it is, I suppose that's one area where we have got two joint coaches. If one's in the room at the time and one's out, yeah. You know, they'll tell one that like, you might have just nipped off for a chat with someone for two seconds, but then he'll get that information and he'll lead on that aspect yeah. as opposed to if, you know, Jack was the lead and I was the assistant, they would then just go to Jack, even if he was out of the room, they say, oh, look, will you pass this on to Jack? Yeah. It, it can get a bit, it can get a little bit skewed at times, definitely. So, so I guess there is some sort of clarity and, and constant communication between you two, is, I guess, is vital. Yeah, definitely, yeah. 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 And the fact, I guess, it helps you both get along with each other. Of course, yeah. Look, and I, I think even if you didn't, I think you have to just remain professional. And when it comes to you, to that side of it, I think you know you, you don't have to be best mates, but as long as you're on the same mm. page when it comes to the football and what the, what we're trying to do with the lads, then you know you you can just crack on. Yeah, don't tell him this, but you've got better jokes than him. <laughs> That's not hard. He gets <laughs> on it out of his phone, doesn't he? <laughs> um, I'm really uh, we've, we're coming up to now of, of discussing completely everything that's associated with uh, academy football so I'm, I'm really grateful Rossi for your uh, time Tom and Tom have you got any final sort of questions or thoughts for Rossi at all the only, the only question, last question I've got Rossi which is um, probably one for like an answer which might help our audience right? which is our students and probably just like at the moment people as coaches are I've got probably got more time than ever just to like have a pause strategize reflect um but whilst that's also going on there's also like a lot of online content and seems to be a web new webinar popping up including our own uh every five minutes so I suppose it's just like how are you utilizing this period of in essence what was just a bit of a down period but obviously still got a connection with the players, but just in relation to just being able to pause and think about your own coaching practice, really, and like, thinking about next year. Yeah, I think the first thing I did, uh, I don't know if you've been the same, but I, I definitely took it as a little opportunity to have a bit of uh, a bit of time off and mentally just like recharge. You know, as soon as I knew that it was going to be, we were going to be off for at least three weeks, there were still jobs, responsibilities to do, but I Definitely, definitely, rightly or wrongly, and I just thought, you know what, this is a good time to really just kind of, I don't, like, read, I'm reading Pochettino's book, I've had it for about three years, and <laughs> I've never, never got around to reading it, and I'm actually sitting there every morning, I have a coffee, and I go, right, I'll read like, you know, 30, 40 pages of it, and it's brilliant, because there's no one telling me to do this, do that, so like, mentally, was is the big thing for me I do think you need to like go right okay what what are the things that I really want to do in life what do I enjoy doing can I get back to those but you know the fact that I'm reading Pochettino's book shows that I'm still it's still football it's still little ideas and I'm scribbling down all right he did that did he so I'm still still picking up things from that and and once I'd sort of got through that I felt more I was ready to then sort of crack on with you know things like webinars and and all that but there. The, the big one is the, the club's been good with um, putting out like a, a technical program. So just getting ideas from other coaches and speaking to other people and, and their ideas and putting everything together and, you know, try, try not to get too carried away with it all, but just making sure my, you're keeping in the loop with what's going on in football. And, you know, as a side note, like one thing I want to do while I'm off is some ideas of of um, sessions, you know, I've had some ideas for a while and again, you just never seem to get the time to write them down. So, you know, I've got some ideas that I want to try and work through in my head and and then when we do get back, hopefully I can I'll put those into practice. So, what, what about yourself? Yeah, I suppose I, uh, similar to you, the first thing is that you just get an opportunity to pause a little bit, like um, obviously being part-time at Fulham and then full-time at St Mary's, it just means that you, you seem to be on the go all the time. But um, yeah, having an opportunity, I think, just to take a moment, really, just to like 
just to enjoy having just a bit more of a like normal schedule eating dinner at a normal time with your family or whatever it's just just quite nice um for the first few days anyway um <laughs> and then uh she's got her headphones in so it's fine um uh but then yeah i think just then just trying to yeah start to consider i think probably reviewing start to review it like the season pretty like it's, it's pretty much done and then start to consider next year i think just invest maybe a little bit more time in starting to plan a little bit more rather than the two weeks we normally have off and an off season before you're back in pre-season again and before you know it you're trying to do that at the same time as everything else yeah yeah somehow what about you yeah just, yeah, just one last thing again for the benefit of the Starting out now, I think three as many as me. I remember now, four, four years ago, um, without making obviously black or Tom, sorry, mate. It's yeah. for me, I couldn't. Yeah. Sorry, Tom. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. Yeah, um, again, just a last question for Rossi. Um, a lot of our students are in the outset of their coaching careers, and without making Rossi blush whatsoever, um, like three or four years ago when I was, um, going in between age groups at the academy there was a period where I was assisting Rossi and some under 14 games and I always remember you saying to me about how beneficial it was that I was prepared to actually give some of my own thoughts while the game was going on and then in between breaks which was really beneficial for me at the time to kind of get that justification that it, it was a good thing that I was showing a little bit of confidence to have um to express myself and I think a lot of our students often find that a little bit tough um, in whichever setting they're in so I think it'd just be interesting to get your thoughts Rossi about um, how that's appreciated by maybe coaching staff that are a little bit more senior at the time um, around that. Yeah no I remember you come along Tom it was great because you just you know you were still playing parts and you only just finished so your ideas were a lot more modern than mine where I'd, I'd stopped playing for a few years so you know, it, you and a, your own personal case was, was brilliant because you had ideas that um, that were different to mine. And I think that's the case with everybody. You know, it doesn't matter your background in football. Everybody sees things differently. And there's, there'll be something that, that everyone can take from, from everything they say. From, sorry, from, there'll be something you can take from what everybody has to, to say. And it's never... It's never a case of oh, what, are you, what are you going on about, you know. It's it's actually like you know what, that's brilliant. I didn't think of that, you know. I don't think you should ever assume, oh, they'll just they'll know that already, or they'll they'll be thinking that because you can, in a game, so many things can be going on. You might be focusing on one aspect, and you know. So I, I don't think I think it's great that coaches, young coaches coming through, should just always go look. I don't want to be in his ear all the time. Because then that can get too much, you know. Like that's, you know, you've got to know your limits. Because when there, there's a time to speak up and a time not to. But if you're asked your opinion and you're encouraged to, you've got to speak up. And it and it's good practice. It's you can build relationships. You've got your own ideas, you know. And even if you don't quite hit the nail on the head, you know, the the coach might then say, well, actually, yeah, no. But look, I, I was I'm looking for this, so I'll take your point on board. You know, unless he's a he's an idiot, the coach, he, he's going to be really sort of responsive and you know, and take on board what you've got to say. So I would encourage it. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Uh, Andy, Tom and Tom, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll call time on this conversation. Um, I, I found it really interesting. And again, Rossi, what, what, you know, I know we you, we walk past this, the corridor of an evenings and... Uh, Hello, and we have a laugh and a joke, and you batter me, and I just take it again and again. Um, but um, no, it's it's really, and you know, one thing I've learned is that I need to be, I need to be more confident and, and, and have these conversations with people like yourself because you you learn so much uh, during this this sort of uh, last hour and and all the small the small opportunities we get to talk. I think is is really important. So apologies now if when we go back that that I'm badgering you for a coffee. Uh, and a lift it and a lift in as well um <laughs> okay guys um happy easter everyone um yep yeah, uh, and rossi if you can do the honors of, of uh, stopping the recording yes. by pressing those three buttons we'll do uh do you want to do it now and then press stop recording all right okay we'll do 
IT is not down on your professional development, is it? 